This has got to be another Convergence Forum with Red Wasp in Belgium and myself here on Montreal, Quebec, Quebec. And uh, we, uh, you know, we're just uh, chatting away and we just have to record this, you know, because I was, you know, like being sort of uh, perhaps silly and saying that this is a strange new world rather than a brave new world or a uh, new world order or whatever, you know, this is a very strange new world, but it has been contested and is not so strange because it is not so different than it was before. And uh, irrespective of, yes, the strangeness factor in capitalism, we can have sort of a scale, goes from zero up to 10. No, it goes only from about three up to 10. There is no two, one or zero. <laughs> and the strangeness factor in the, in the capitalism scale of things, you know, like it's uh, the war, you know, that continues in and of itself, you know, it's self-rationalizing because in capitalism, in order to build something, you have to, you know, have reason to build it, you know, and if it didn't exist already, it wasn't needed. So, you know, like you have to destroy what was needed in the first place in order to rebuild, you know, what was needed in order to justify the dynamic of capitalism, which is always, you know, to build more, greater, greater, to, uh, become the great again, you know, which it wasn't ever and it not is now. That's an admission on its own part, you know, the Trump slogan, isn't it? You know, when they talk about, what is it, uh, make make the USA great again? Make, make us, oh, make, make America great again. Oh, America, okay. okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so, well, that's a sort of an admission, isn't it? You know, that America is no longer great. If it was great before, and it wants to be great again, because why? Because it is no longer great. Ah, oh, fatal flaw, fatal flaw. Yeah, they've got a neurotic sort of obsession with themselves. They think that their well-being only exists, you know, in synchronicity with that of the USA state. Ah, then when it cracks up and starts to break up into all sorts of constituents, What's going to happen then? Hmm. Mass psychosis, picking up the gun to protect oneself, just like Israel. Yes, Israel must protect itself. What is Israel? Oh, it's a state that calls itself Israel, but it's just sort of a minority of the Jewish people that says that it's Jewish, you know, but it's no different than any European state and is colonialist in intent, statement, purpose, and existence. So, hmm. War, war, and more war. No more. I I actually um the first time that uh, Trump got elected, I was afraid that we were really um fast forwarding into World War Three, because Trump got elected. But if this time during his campaign he said that he didn't start any new wars, um that's true, and that was a trend breaker. So. Maybe Trump is running for a faction of the, the, the American bourgeoisie who um, wants to be more careful um, in, in a world order that is changing. I don't know. that Everybody is making predictions right now, but... Um, yeah, who knows? I, I think that... Um, I'm not saying that having Trump, but not having one of the the the, the Biden Harris clan, um, um, not having them winning, might be quite a good thing for the people of Russia and Ukraine. Um, and oh yeah. Even um, the, uh, over the last years, and especially over the last year, uh, there has been. A, <laughs> Growing contradictions between what the Zionist state is doing, the way they are protecting the American interests, the, the interest of empire, and the core of empire uh, itself, um, the, the ruling class in the United States, who feel more and more that th their interests are not served by this ethnic cleansing and so on. Maybe even for them... Um, Everybody's constantly saying that Trump and Netanyahu are the best possible friends, but maybe Trump will um, actually be tougher. And so when it comes to wars mm. and when it, when it comes to um, the rest of the world, I'm not sure if it was the worst 
uh, uh, choice. The, 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 the bad thing, of course, being that um, you can only choose one of the two sides of the big imperial party. All the, the other parties are uh, discarded even before the elections begins. Yeah. <clears throat> Who knows what Trump is going to do? Even Trump probably doesn't know what he's going to do. He sort of reacts, you know, on a uh, conjunctural sort of basis, mm. even on a daily basis, you know. He probably is uh, making sort of uh, deals in order to satisfy um, oh, uh, material and immediate interests without any consideration, except for an ideology, of course. And what is that ideology? Oh, well whatever fits into, you know, the prosperity of the United States of America. What is that? His prosperity and the prosperity of the national bourgeoisie. So he's going to sort of put a tariff. <laughs> he's going to put a tariff on imports from China, in particular the electric uh, vehicle from China, which is now sold, as ready, sold to uh, a million more vehicles than the uh, Tesla vehicle. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, will crack open the American market, you know, to be sold, you know, at the price at which it is competitive and which it is successful as well, because uh, China doesn't starve its workers, <laughs> basically, you know, <laughs> that's the difference. So, uh, okay, so, you know, what's going to happen with this tariff? Well, you know, that means that uh, you know, they're still going to sell, you know, electric vehicles from China and the United States and American vehicles will not be bought in the United States by Americans because they can get a, probably a better vehicle for less cost, even with the tariff. Even the so-called American electrical, uh, electric vehicles are full of um, parts that come from China and the rest of the world. Uh, the the uh -huh. idea of a national auto production, that, that's something that was a, a reality in the 20th century, but it, it, it no longer exists. Um, most industries, and especially the, 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 the uh, automobile industry, have completely globalized. So the, the, the glo globalization of the industrial process um, is a reality in, in several sectors, especially that sector. So... A car yes. that is assembled, I don't know, um, somewhere in the United States has parts from Mexico, from Canada, from China, from... But the whole vehicle can come from Mexico because they have NAFTA, mm -hmm. not just parts. So, yes. but, you know, that creates the same dynamic, you know, whether for China or for Mexico or for Mexico, China, in that it removes, you know, domestic, you know, capital from the market in the United States away from American companies to other companies mm -hmm. and, other, and other economies entirely, which are in competition with that economy. So that, you know, begins, you know, a slow spiral because it's going to happen in everything else. Started in small products, household products and tools. And now, you know, the biggest uh, of, of the, you know, consumer products, you know, in the mass market. So this is going to be a slow spiral down for the American market. You know, because it cannot capitalize itself anymore. So it cannot, you know, longer be confined to the American state. The transnational American corporations now are parasitic on a world scale, not just the United States. They can sacrifice the United States economy. They can sacrifice the American working class. They don't care. <laughs> you know, they've got holdings like here in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, you know, like... <laughs> You know, General Dynamics is making its bombs, you know, for the genocidal campaign in Gaza right here in Montreal. They don't need American workers. You know, this has become, you know, like a world phenomenon. This U.S. capitalism is just not U.S. anymore. Transnational capitalism is a much greater threat. Yeah. 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 I'm just sort of making myself depressed. <laughs> It's. Um, I didn't really uh, expect much difference from the elections, um, hmm. and I, I think that um, the political spectacle that is being going on there for um, 
ever since uh, 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 the second Bush got elected and even before with Clinton, um, the political has become more and more spectacular in, in, in the sense that the, the situationists use that word. It, it, it has mm. become um, something that is completely mediated through images that are constructed and and. Trump, but also Harris, uh, uh, are completely a part of that spectacle. Um, mm -hmm. But the way that yeah. it has, right now, it, it it has become so spectacular in 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 that sense that I think the underlying uh, infrastructure is is um, is crumbling down, and that's why you get the, the, this whole facade. And and um, I think. The, the previous elections, uh, presidential elections, were the um, most expensive elections um, in the history of humanity. I think that th the record was broken now. Um, mm. So it, it's a completely... Um, this has nothing to do with politics anymore. The, 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 this has... Um, it, it, it's a show, it's a charade, but this shows that... Um, the, the, the structure of the, the, the American empire is going to collapse and is already collapsing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, just as what is happening in, in, in the Zionist state, um, the ruling class in a system that is in free fall, like, uh, like the Zionist state, like the United States, um, their only option is fascism. So you get a fascization, which it, it didn't start with the, 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 the previous Trump. It didn't start... Um, actually, if you look, the, the 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 power of surveillance that intelligence service has got um, under Bush, but also under Obama, the the, the way they constantly um, uh, uh, were able to expand their possibilities, um, the, the the whole grounds for the fascist state have been laid um, by Bush, by Obama, um, before Trump, and now they will gradually. Um, take away more and more of the civil rights. Um, but every time that a ruling class in history tried to do that, the, uh, the, the people, even the, even people who, are, who have a very conservative mindset right now, they all have a boiling point. And if you push them further than that, they become revolutionaries. Unless if they're also the, the, the big billionaire capitalist class, then of course they don't mind because they know that it serves their interests. But even the most conservative person, if they take away more and more of, of, of their rights, at some point they will join the resistance. This is what happened in, 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 in Nazi Germany. This is what you had um, Nazi generals who were at some point conspiring uh, to, to, to assassinate Hitler. Um, hmm. So, unfortunately, hmm. I think that Fascism is being installed, and the same would have happened with um, Super Cop Harris, who who would, um, uh, um, when she was still uh, the, a prosecutor, she actually um, hid evidence that could uh, uh, um, set people free who who were on death row. Um, mm. Just because uh, her office uh, uh, w would get a bad name if they had to admit that they made a mistake and so on. So, I mean, if she were president, we would also see fascism being installed in the next four years, but mm. maybe with more balloons and 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 in a form uh, and rainbow colors and everything you like. And but um, th the same thing would happen. Um, all possibilities mm. of res uh, of rebellion will be shut down. We mm. see this happening with the students' uh, protests uh, against this uh, genocide. Mm. This will be expanded more and more, um, but there will be resistance. And um... mm -hmm. yes, so you know, in this, a way... it's a strange world. I do agree uh, on that. Yeah. Um, oh but... yes. It, it would have been just as strange if um, Harris and actually with um, one of the beautiful Harris. things that um, yeah. Biden has that one of the great services uh, for humanity that Biden has uh, done over the last months is that he completely unveiled the the, the whole charade. I mean, yeah. they have yeah. a. They have a person who is completely demented. He should be somewhere where he 
where he can enjoy his last months or or, or years uh, in, in some quiet, but oh. he's not capable of doing anything uh, mature anymore. Um, yeah. he's, he's still able to be president. Why? Because the president is just like one of the puppets. And um, yeah, so Sullivan, I'm yes. sure with Donald Trump mm -hmm. being the, the chief puppet, there will be way more show again and way more chaos like uh, a few years ago. But yeah, Biden is was leaving, uh, living out, you know, a delusion, a Zionist delusion of his, you know, because he was, you know, Christian, Christian, mm -hmm. uh, what evangelical Zionist, I suppose. He was a Catholic. Yeah, he is, but, he is a Catholic. He's still alive. Yeah, but you know, he picked up this Americanism. You know, the Americanism. Mm. You know, part of it. You know, like led him to identify more so as a Zionist than a Catholic. Although his Catholic sort of you know thing was basically transliterated into an Irish identity, so that he avoided you know the catholic identity in that way so he was more identified as he declared as a zionist which is in alignment you know with the american evangelical christian movement mm. and the southern baptist church black Bath baptist church which used to be as pro-zionist i wonder what it is now but nonetheless you know it is all spectacular you know as this situationist you know would say the spectacle, you know, like uh, was, it seems to me like a slap in the face now, you know, to the Democrats, you know, they thought they could get away with saying nothing, offering no program, just, you know, claiming that, you know, beyond them, you know, lies the abyss and that you have to vote for them because you have no other choice. <laughs> slap in the face, you know, and if they want the second one, you know, they can get it too. Now, what about the 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 socialists, the so-called socialists, the Democratic Socialists of America, who are inside the Democratic Party, you know, are they going to sort of, you know, think about what they can do other than, you know, tail end, you know, a Democratic bourgeois party that's a loser? <laughs> really, you know, they should give them some food for thought. They should quit to set up their own sort of uh, united front. Oh, they can join our convergence, you know, if they want. But I think that they will more so, you know, look to the labor movement for an alliance because that's the problem. You can't quit the Democratic Party without quitting the labor alliances that they have. So that's the key to the affair. So in order to change that, one has to go to the labor movement first, find out if the labor movements are still satisfied, you know, with the existing state of affairs and if they want to form a Labor Party. Have they heard about such a thing? <laughs> you know, like have Americans, you know, ever sort of learned anything from from international history and not just American history? Well, there's a Labor Party that's possible. So will they go for it? So they should be all canvassed. And if not, then the factions inside those lab, those uh, unions who are in favor of a Labor Party should form a a you know front internally that will overthrow that given un union leadership and form trade unions that will be willing to form a labor party so then we have a labor party movement forming up as a result of this that's possible will they do it i think it'll take them about a year <laughs> to think about doing it until they come across our video here <laughs> <laughs> if, if we would just find a way to unite all the communist and trotskyist and, and and marxist and 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 maoist and i don't know what other um anti-capitalist parties that already exists um in yeah. the united states we yeah. would have a strong Big communist force. party yeah 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 um, like and... here in quebec you know we formed a uh a united front of the left after we mm -hmm. left uh after we quit the uh, federal NDP and we formed the, uh, the Quebec NDP formed its own, you know, uh, PS Parti Democracy Socialiste, and then we eventually evolved together with unionizing with the feminist movement Option Citoyenne to form the uh, uh, Quebec Solidaire, which now has ten seats in mm -hmm. the National Assembly of Quebec, and we're united with you know CSN, the trade union movement. Whereas the other big trade union movement is allied with the uh, center nationalist, uh, right nationalist uh, Parti Québécois. Not so right, center, center. And there's also a center right nationalist party as well. You know, all this can happen. You know, the whole thing sort of could crack up 
before it was the same here as Canada, you know, but no longer. It's completely different, you know, political landscape. Same thing can happen in the United States now. It's, you know, the Democratic Party is going to crack up. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but I think that, um, of course, it, it's very easy for me from this side of the Atlantic to give uh, my comments because I don't live in uh, the United States. De but, Tocqueville, um, De Tocqueville. <laughs> mm -hmm. De Tocqueville, he did the most, uh, the best analysis of the American sort of political scene. Yes, but it, it, it's, I, I think that um, we will have to find a way to, or our comrades in the States will have to find a way to create a movement um, that is not just focused on elections, because right now the system is, is, is completely rigged. I mean, there are these two um, very, very similar parties or very, very similar wings of um, one imperial party. And right now, um, even if, if, if they make a labor party, um, it will not be able to break that um, two party monopoly. Um, but if we find ways to, to, to create a movement and one party or several parties that are really active um, in ways to or find ways to bridge like the, the BLM movement and the um, anti-genocide movement and uh, the many ecological movement and the, the, the queer and trans movements and all these protest movements to find ways, to, well, a convergence of all these movements. Um, something that is happening on the streets and not just in the ballot box and certainly not just on the internet, um, that would be able to create some change. Um, hmm. If we find ways to reconnect people with their actual history. Right now, I, one of the words that I've heard um, quite often the last few weeks um, was um, when liberal people were speaking about Trump voters, they uh, often used the word redneck. So, um, which is no used a bit generically for white people coming from the southern states, but the word redneck has a very uh, a class struggle origin. Um, there were huge strike movements in the coal mines, and those who were on strike, those who were members of the labor union, they put a red bandana around their necks. That that's the origin of the rednecks. Uh -huh. um, if we find ways to reconnect. Um, the white working class people um, in these so-called redneck next states with their colored class members, um, this can become a cocktail that is very strong and that can really uh, um, provoke some change. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that uh, our comrades find, find ways to do that and to do it in a way that the Democrats are not at all interested in recuperating this because um, the Democrats... If they step into such a movement, they will only use it for electoral gain. They will, um, as always, be the traitors who completely ignore the goals of the movement as soon as they have the power they desire. But if if comrades are able, Bundist comrades, communists, Leninists, Trotskyists, Maoists, uh, Marxists, people who don't like the word ists, or, or, but all these people who are against capitalism, if we find ways to unite a movement, to have one or maybe several parties and organizational structures that um, that each in their own way find ways to lead it and mm. not to sabotage their comrades in the other party because um, we've wasted so much time in the last two centuries um, leftist people uh, sabotaging other anti-capitalists because um, we diverge in our idea about the permanent revolution or about this or about i mean that's if we find ways to really create this convergence um i would call it an inter-socialist uh, convergence um, of all these different tendencies of real socialism not social democracy and i i i really I've tried to study it, but I haven't found the difference between democratic socialism and social democracy. I mean, it, it, it's just a new word for something that the, for, for the, the, the political uh, pro-capitalist tendency that actually um, voted for the First World War and that betrayed uh, half of Europe during the Second World War and that were very enthusiastic in um, uh, 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 militarily putting down all the uh, colonial uprisings and so on. I mean, 
these people, the social democracy, they are usually not an asset to the movement, but all other um from from the the the, the, the anarchists to the Stalinists and the Maoists and the whole spectrum uh, in between. There is a spectrum haunting Europe, uh, haunting the whole world. Um, I think if we find ways to create convergence, to create, um, what's it called, synergy between these different movements, if we really learn um, the strengths and weaknesses of our comrades uh, from the other uh, 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 tendencies and find ways to to help each other and and to make sure that uh, we can help them overcome their weaknesses and vice versa. If if we, I believe that our diversity it, uh, can be our enormous strength, and if the radical left, the the, the anti capitalist left in the United States, um, use the next years to do this then no matter um, who will be the candidates in 2028 for the elections, um, the political discussions will be about uh, workers' rights, will be about uh, the, the, the forever wars, will be... And that is something that we have to, well, once again, that our comrades on the other side of the Atlantic have to work uh, 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 towards. And I think that it's possible. Mm -hmm. I do believe that there is a new generation that is less sectarian than we and our ancestors in the left used to be. Yes, especially amongst the Jewish youth in the United States. Not so much yet here in Montreal. I felt quite isolated on the vigil. But nonetheless, very sort of uh, engaged because uh, my presence there was so sensitive, you know, for the Jewish community. You know, they had to sort of cope. And they, they didn't know how to cope with me because I wasn't, you know, like one of the stereotypes of what an anti, anti Zionist is supposed to be, you know, like <laughs> that they've been taught. And so I, you know, like I had, I cracked open, you know, their perceptions to allow, you know, in a space that's not filled, you know, with the stereotype. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they had to come and speak with me to find out, you know, what I was and what was wrong with me. But instead, you know, I try to convince them of what was right with me. And uh, so, you know, there's all these videos, you know, the whole thing was recorded by body cam, incredible experience and all the arguments and discussions and the dialogue that happened there is, you know, archived and archival, incredible phenomena. It is possible to engage, you know, with the most difficult of uh, of uh, communities, you know, to bring about a certain degree of enlightenment. But that's not what P others, you know, were trying to do. You know, the some others, you know, the uh, Palestinian youth movement at Concordia University and uh, the uh, uh, Independent Jewish Voices uh, of Canada. Montreal branch came down there, you know, to to express their anger and hatred of those who were going into the Jewish Community Center because they suspected that they were going to a meeting of some real estate agent from mm -hmm. Palestine who was selling Palestinian lands from Gaza and occupied territories in general, possibly, you know, to possible buyers of uh, the Jewish community who come from Montreal. But it was also the entranceway, you know, to the Holocaust Museum and to the library where my books are. So, you know, it was sort of, you know, very like stupid of them to not engage and rather disengage and to sort of, you know, use the whole sort of, you know, event as a spectacle of hatred, even though their slogans were just slogans. Nonetheless, you know, there was one of the characters, I think, from the Palestinian youth movement who made a Hitler salute in an ambiguous gesture, either sort of accusing the uh, the Jewish uh, participants that evening in the Jewish community centers of being Nazis, or he was saying that he himself was considered himself to be a Nazi against the Jewish Zionists that he saw there and that he wanted to kill them. So, you know, this sort of ambiguity, you know, passes over the heads of the people there and they don't care. And then they think that they've accomplished something for the Palestinians when in fact, you know, they've made things worse. And they got themselves uh, 
banned by injunction. <laughs> Plus, they're being sued for costs. It's an incredible, you know, debacle that they've made of themselves because they don't know what they're doing. They didn't want to come to the vigil that I started, you know, with the Jewish Bund. No, that's too Jewish for them. <laughs> it's a terrible situation. And with such, you know, sort of mentality and tactics, are we going to be able to liberate Palestine? No. Not so easy. I, I, I think that, that we need... Um... First of all, I, I I don't really understand. So it was in the same building. There was the vigil, and there was a library. There was the, the, the Holocaust Museum, and there was um this this real estate gathering. Yeah, I I can understand that some comrades um were confused, especially the the this um new solidarity movement with Palestine has a whole lot of very very new baby comrades who really um are only starting to build up their experience. So um that's what but, we used to call uh, neophytes. Oh well, yes. And uh, I think that everybody who uh, is a veteran now at some point was a neophyte. Yeah. And um I, I don't want to recall all the all the big mistakes that I made at my 14, 15 years old when I started becoming politically active. My well, biggest mistake, today. to discuss mistakes, my biggest mistake when I was young was that I was fearful of saying who mm -hmm. I was. You know, I was afraid of saying, you know, to the comrades that I was Jewish, a Jewish Bundist, that I come from a Jewish Bundist, you know, resistance family. I was afraid of telling them that my mother, you know, was a Jewish resistance, you know, fighter, basically, mm -hmm. and her brother, too. And that they should invite her to come and speak, you know, at the forums that they were holding every Friday night. But no, I didn't. You know, because I knew that they wouldn't be interested. And I didn't want to disturb the comrades. <laughs> yeah. but that's something that I also, but I think when you're young, you are easily intimidated by people who have been in the movement for a very long time and they all act as if they really, really know what they're doing and as if everything they do is very, very important. And I mean, this happens everywhere. And as a young person, it's very easy to be intimidated by that. Yeah. Um, right now, I think that um, sometimes annoying some of the comrades has become part of my world or of my life mission because... <laughs> Uh, and some of the comrades annoy me in ways that um, months or years later turn out to have been interesting educational experiences for me also, because um, we all have to learn. We were all uh, born and raised in a bourgeois capitalist system. And so we all have to, uh, being a revolution is always becoming a revolutionary. Uh, but being a revolutionary is always becoming a revolutionary until you die because sounds like a, a personal uh, personal permanent revolution yes it's uh but yeah. well, i think that the permanent revolution is a term that is very popular in trotskyist uh, uh um in, in in the trotskyist parts of the movement i come from the more uh, maoist parts of the movement or that's where i was in my adolescence and i think they call it uh, uh the cultural revolution the, the 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 great proletarian cultural revolution oh yes 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 and, you know, what's funny about, you know, the Purina revolution that I met up with in the Trotskyist movement is that they never sort of knew or would admit that Purina revolution didn't start with Trotskyism, it started with anarchism. Mm -hmm. That was a whole sort of concept that was discussed and elaborated on and with the writings that are all published now in two volumes <laughs> that discussed Purina revolution from an anarchist perspective to begin with. And then it was incorporated into a more sort of, you know, political economy by Trotsky, and he created something that was, you know, au-delà, au-delà, you know, above, above, you know, the mm. anarchist conception, and developed it into a theory, you know, like of, uh, of world revolution, you know, that was actually, in, in an actuality that was ongoing, that was happening, and then encompassed, you know, third worldism as well, in effect, even though it wasn't called as such in the time. Because his concept of permanent revolution was centered and, and focused on the analysis, the analysis that he had of the 1936, you know, China Revolution, which failed because of the Popular Front coalition with the National Bourgeoisie. 
he criticized that and developed further, you know, with proof on the Chinese revolution of what the permanent revolution should be as it existed in the Soviet Union. And it could exist, you know, in the other colonial countries, which need not go through a capitalist stage of development, despite the NEP and stuff. But, you know, this permanent revolution, you know, Trotsky did a nice job, I think, of implementing it as an application of theory to practice. But the anarchists developed it as a concept in the first place because they are, uh, uh, they were permitted themselves to do so because they had a critique of the state, mm -hmm. which the others did not have. You know, both the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks were both centered and focused on the state. On what state was that? State that existed before, that they wanted to take over in the name of a, a you know, a communist party, which would proclaim a workers and peasants government in the what? In the state. Was the state that existed before? <laughs> the same state that existed under the government that they created. A bourgeois state. <laughs> Trying to establish, you know, a workers and peasants government on a bourgeois state. Yeah, man, good luck. It didn't work. Okay. Because the anarchists took on the state and critiqued the state, they allowed themselves to develop a concept of permanent revolution that went beyond the mere, you know, economic, you know, political economic, you know, revolution that the Marxists were proposing in terms of class, one class overthrowing another. Now they're talking about, you know, one regime being overthrown by another. The other, they don't know what it was. You know, the anarchists, you know, just wanted to overthrow the regime, but they didn't know what, you know, to replace it with. So that's why Bundism comes along. Bundism proposes a constitutional, you know, uh, format which goes beyond the nation state, in fact, negates the nation state with what the Bund called national cultural autonomy. That's why that concept is key, not only to Bundism, not only to the critique of Zionism as an alternative, but also to the world, you know, uh, constitutional revolution. We have not only political economy, economic revolution, class revolution, we have cultural revolution, and we have now a constitutional revolution that we have to constitute in order to make uh, an alternative uh, mode of existence, of political existence. You know, and the alternative is not, you know, not cracking all of the nation states up into little pieces and every little piece governs itself. You know, that's feudalism. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I mean, you know, if we had a third world war, you know, we'd be reduced to that, yes. But to choose it <laughs> as an alternative, you know, to regress in history, you know, because it was pretty, <laughs> so-called, pretend, pretend pretty, <laughs> forget it, you know, like, that's not what I want. You know, we have to advance into something that's more advanced. And that's a federation, not just a confederation. I mean, you know, the nation states can try to save themselves by forming a confederation for mutual aid when they, after having finally figured out what mutual aid is. Mm -hmm. but being competitive at the same time. So they have an ingrained uh, contradiction. But they won't be able to do so because they want to preserve the nation state and the confederation. And the contradictions, you know, continue nonetheless. The nation state will crumble as well. So you begin with national cultural autonomy on the basis of people, people nations, not territory, not property, not frontiers, not the national bourgeoisie, either, which encompass all those things. Those are the attributes of the national bourgeoisie. Nation state, property, frontiers, all that stuff. Uh, personal property rights is another matter. I'm talking about, you know, collective rights. So the collective has to take over, like in the English Revolution of, what was it, 1260, when the common lands were, were taken over, took over, you know, the, um, the um, royal royal lands, the property, mm -hmm. the, the lands that were sort of considered private property of the royalty and were fenced off. You know, the royalty put up a fence, said you can't come over here, you know, with your sheep and your cattle because yeah, this is our, you know, royal grass. <laughs> you cannot touch it. So they tore up the fences, you know, took down the frontiers, created commons, the common lands, public parks, as they call them here in Canada. But they're still under the same law and same condition. That's why I was able to keep, you know, a peace camp tent going on Parliament Hill, on the common lands of Parliament Hill, a public park. 
<laughs> because it was in law, constitutional law. <laughs> you know, in the United States, you can't do that. You can't put up a tent in front of the White House. <laughs> no way. No, in front of the Capitol building, no way. No, you get arrested. <laughs> you get beat up. <laughs> no. So, you know, like, that's what we have to do, you know, like abolish, you know, the state uh, together with the national bourgeoisie, you know, and all of its property rights so that we have collective rights over property and over all the accomplishments that the working class has achieved, including all the intellectual workers. You know, we don't call, you know, like uh, engineers and uh, scientists middle class. No, they're working. They're working class. They're skilled workers. You know, but, but even was... students are, are apprentice workers, you know, and should be paid. <laughs> you know. There was one thing that um, Lenin and later Mao developed um, that uh, in the situation, in, in, in the circumstances that we live now today, um, the working class, the, the proletariat, even in the most broad definition, um, are not the, the, the sole revolutionary force. Um, there are, of course, um, in, in, in many um, of the neo-colonies, there's a lot of uh, um, working class people working in the agricultural uh, uh, sector, but we can also include them in a proletariat. But there mm. are, um, for example, in colonized nations, there is a large part of the national bourgeoisie whose um, interests are also far more hindered by the colonization than uh, advanced. And uh, it is possible, I think that I still defer with uh, uh, Trotskyism on that point. I do believe that it is possible to um, have alliances, to have a united front with parts of the bourgeoisie that are actually um, uh, in conflicting interests with the leading parts of the bourgeoisie. Well, 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 okay. I mean, I would agree to a donation from Soros, you know, <laughs> you know so that we can build a real alternative to Zionism in terms of the Jewish Bund. Yeah, but um, no so control. It's not part uh, part of that potentially revolutionary uh, uh, part of the bourgeoisie. He's yeah. a hedge fund fund he's manager. A that could, he could be a donor, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, if he wants to he's actually not a, do a something, poor... you know, then he should uh, he should go to university and study more. <laughs> um, but th there are, for example, in um, for example, we can see this in Palestine. Um, quite mm. a large part of the national bourgeoisie in Palestine, um, they're just as much uh, uh, um, persecuted by the Zionist state as the, 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 the Palestinian proletariat. Yeah. And in the diaspora, we can often see that they are, for example, financing quite a lot of the struggle because having a struggle, um, you cannot struggle for free. Well, we can perhaps, more yeah. but then it becomes a matter of individuals, you know, individual, you know, mm -hmm. bourgeois, and petty bourgeois, and what and what they mean, you know, like even Lenin, you know, came from an upper petty bourgeois family, you know, and was qualified as a lawyer, trained and qualified mm -hmm. in the in the royal institutions, you know, of the imperial Russian Empire. <laughs> he was, you know, a state, you know, diplomat, uh, you know, lawyer, uh, so a state officer in effect, but. He didn't like that his brother got, you know, knocked off like that. It's personal. Since, you know, his brother, you know, like was right. So that's it. That's all. That's, you know, what can make it all a difference, you know, in an individual like that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, let's see now. There has to be, you know, like uh, some new initiatives. Demonstrations continue and should continue, you know, but as we can see, you know, they're not enough. But they are very crucial in the United States right now, you know, because if uh, the new uh, president-elect, you know, doesn't see protests in the streets, you know, to stop the genocide in Gaza, he's going to figure that he's got an open road there, you know. It's very calculating, you know. If he doesn't see an open road, he's not going to build himself a road, you know, at his own expense. So the pressure has to be kept up for sure and old. Yeah.
Here in Canada, yeah. the war production has to be taken on. This hypocritical liberal government has got to go. I would look forward to a government of the uh, social democratics and the uh, and the Quebec uh, Quebec uh, Quebec party, the Bloc Québécois. Those two could form a government and build a new kind of a confederation here if they wanted to. That's possible. But otherwise, you know, it would be the Conservative Party that would take over in Canada. Now, the in England, though, the uh, the new Conservative Labour Party <laughs> has mm. taken over. Well, what they're going to do, it's interesting. You know, the Foreign Minister Lamy, very interesting personage. You know, like I liked his, you know, presentation that he made in the Parliament, but he's only gone a, to a partial degree on stopping you know, the war production from England going into the genocide. So, you know, it's a certain inconsistency there. So we'll see what happens. It can turn either way. France, how are they going to resolve that? You know, there should be, you know, a left government right now trying to block the whole governmental process. Constitutional crisis in France. Got to get rid of Macron. So the presidential elections are going to resolve that dispute. That's coming up when? I don't know. Mustn't be in the immediate future, otherwise we would know. Germany, German government has just cracked up. What's happened there? Do you know? I haven't really followed it. Yeah, not much information provided. I guess it's embarrassing or something. Whenever the information is embarrassing, the news, you know, presents, you know, vague, sort of ambiguous formulations to cover up what's actually happening. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Well, we shall continue that we know for sure. But one of the things that, that I read a few days ago, um, after what happened on Tuesday with the, 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 the big clone being elected and so, a lot of people are now in a panic mode and they're, they're trying to reinvent the wheel. They're trying to reinvent boiling water. And a lot has already been done over the last few years. And of course, um, all these existing projects need people, extra people to support them. But um, a, a, a big foundation has already been laid um, during the first Trump years. And even before that, there are strong anti-fascist movements um, in uh, all of Turtle Island, there is um, all that we have to find is, is ways to, 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 to create a unity there. And maybe um, for the Bundist movement, um, there is a special task of finding new ways uh, 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 to um, organize that part of the young Jewish working class that is right now like so many others, being disillusioned by the liberal agenda, by the, the liberal bourgeoisie, and who is right now being radicalized. Um, I, I I think that the time is ripe for a new Bundist movement um, and that, uh, that there are actually already a lot of uh, seeds uh, which have been planted over the last years and especially the last year. No, we have to find a way to unite all that and to um, reunite the Bund as radical socialist Jewish project. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's possible. Yes. Hmm. I, I hope so, because as a Muslim, I'm trying to learn from it, and then we will do exactly the same with the Muslims, inshallah. Hmm. Yes. The way the Bund was formed, you know, as a non-status social movement, with uh, the program and the uh, constitutional perspective necessary to establish a uh, yeah, ec ec equitarian, equitarian social fabric organically rooted in the nature of the people concerned, you know, with uh, full autonomy for each uh, social constituent and each social formation, including genders, religious communities, each community, you know, in the social fabric, you know, needs its own existence and justify itself, you know, by its own existence. It doesn't need any external justification 
All this has to be recognized by civil society, irrespective of what the state may consider to have been legitimate or not. State has to go, not anybody else. Hmm. Thanking you for your perspective today, Red Wasp in Belgium. And this is Dr. Abraham Weisfeld here in Montreal, Quebec. Until next week on the Convergence Forum. Thanking you for your attention. Bye-bye. Yes,